Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to talk about controlling a 2D character's animation inside of Unity, comparing using animator transitions, which is where you would have your animation or blend tree in the animator, and you can right click and make a transition to other animation states, and contrasting that with simply putting all of the animation logic into one of your component scripts like your player controller. So if I go ahead and launch a demo scene for this game, you can see that although I have no transitions between any of the animation states of the blend trees, that I can actually play all of the animations at the correct time, depending on what user input I am pressing. So there's the hit animation and what is currently set up to be the die animation as well. So all five of these states were able to play successfully, and you can see that there's no transitions between them. So in this case, that means that all of the animation logic is controlled through code. So I can jump into the current version of my player controller script, and you can see how this works. So you'll notice here that for controlling the direction of the player, I am still using an animation parameter. So that is the move X left and right movement and move Y up down movement. The reason for doing that is that I am allowing the blend trees to still control the animation direction for each of the animation states. So if you idle with a character like this in a top down game, you can idle down, left, right and up. And the same applies for all of the other animations. So the walk blend tree has four options for the directions. Attack will have four directions, so on and so forth, being able to die in four directions as well. So the only part that the animator component is really controlling here is the move X, move Y, and using that to select the direction, which I think even if you're going to be trying to play your animations through the code itself, like over here, that it's still best to let the directions be a separate matter that the blend tree just handles naturally. As for the rest of the animation logic, figuring out what animation to play at which time, you can see here this update animation method is basically saying that if there's not a lock on a different animation, then I'm going to play walk if the character is moving. That's if there's a move input. Else, I'm going to idle otherwise. So to selectively play the animation, you just do play and then the string name of the animation itself. So that's going to be here. Player idle blend, player walk blend, player attack and so on. Now you'll see I'm not manually typing the strings in here, but rather I actually have a scriptable object that holds all of these. So up here at the top, player animation strings is just a custom uh, scriptable object I set up. So you can see up here at the top that when you have a scriptable object, you can create it as an asset in your project to have different settings uh, for different game objects that might be using an instance of a scriptable object. So in this case, I'm just creating a menu option to create one of these scriptable objects, and they hold references to the names of the idle, walk, attack, hit, die states, and the move X, move Y parameters and the animator controller. So I'll just take a look at this scriptable object here. You can see it's just a set of strings, but one of the main advantages of using a scriptable object is that you can have different settings that are just swappable by changing which scriptable object you're using uh, for different objects in your game. So if I had, let's say, a different player that for some reason had a different animator uh, set up here, then I could just create a new scriptable object by right clicking, going to create scriptable objects and then player animation strings. And I can just customize all of the settings for that. So back to the rest of the animation logic here, you can see on fire comes from the uh, newer Unity import system as an action. So this I'm using to trigger an attack animation. But the logic here is that it's only if the character is able to move normally. Basically, if it was able to walk or idle, then it should be able to attack. Now the animation logic can get more complicated here just like it could for the uh, animator itself using transitions, maybe depending on how action oriented of a game it is there would be uh, other animation states where you would want to limit attacking. So you might need a bunch of logic, not just can move, but is not in jump state or other things to put in here to make sure that it's still able to attack. So what we're really trying to limit is that the animation logic doesn't get too out of control. I feel like this example right here on screen would probably be about the limit of what you would want. Um, obviously, you can see this is more of a platformer controller that's going to have a whole bunch of different states, like uh, hanging on to a ledge, 
But if your game is more of a top-down Zelda or Earthbound style of game, then there's probably not going to be as many animation states, so it shouldn't ever get as complicated as this anyway. But whether you're using animated transitions like this or you're setting up your logic and code, the logic's still there. So you're still going to have to figure out um, in which states should a character be able to still attack. Should it be able to attack while jumping? That kind of logic. And then you would just have your checks and code like this. So obviously it's pretty simple right now. Just if it can move, then it can attack. And if that is the case, then we play the animation attack. But you'll see here that when I trigger an attack, I turn can move off so that these animations can't play. And as an animation callback function, I have this unlock animation. So when one of these special states that is meant to play out entirely before allowing another animation to play, you can call at the end of the animation, something like this unlock animation to return can move to true and unlocking all of the animations. So the reason I have this separate animation locked variable, which you can see that when a character gets on hit, I lock the animations or when the character dies, I lock animations, basically preventing it from changing to other animations uh, is because in this case, specifically, I still want the player to be able to move. I just want it to only be playing the on hit animation. So when a character gets on hit, I play the hit animation. When a character dies, I play the die animation. So next you're probably wondering, where am I actually calling this on hit and on death? Because it's not in the player controller script directly, but rather if I take a look at the inspector, you'll see that I set up a couple of unity events for character hit and no health left. And this is with the damageable character component. So since the player controller is currently handling the animation, and I am taking damage through the damageable character script, I needed some way to communicate between those two scripts. So one way would be to use uh, send message on the game object and then call any component that has a function of the same name, like on hit to trigger that function. But using a unity event makes it much easier to swap exactly which components you want to use. And it doesn't need to communicate with every component on the script. You just kind of assign them here to be called back when the Unity event does its invokes. So in this case, when the damageable character uh, recognizes that the character was hit, I'm going to call back the on hit animation on the player controller. And when the damageable character runs out of health, then I am going to call back uh, the on death animation on the player controller. So let's show what the Unity events look like inside of the code. So you can see I have two Unity events here, declared character hit and no health left. They have uh, no parameters that they're passing through to the other functions. If you wanted to, you could do that like this. So this would now be a Unity event that passes along a float to any of the functions that are going to be called when the Unity event is invoked. But in this case, I'm just notifying other components that a character was hit or that it ran out of health. So to trigger these events, you need to do a character hit dot invoke or no health left dot invoke. So down here in the code, when this component gets hit, then I'm going to call either character hit invoke or no health left dot invoke, depending on whether the health is above zero or equal to or less than zero. So when you do a dot invoke on a unity event, it's going to mean that any of the functions that are set up here to run inside of the unity event in the inspector are going to trigger. The only real limitation here setting up a unity event in the inspector is that the damageable character and the player controller are going to have to be set up in the same scene or game object in order to be referenced in the inspector like this. And so it's set up in the editor. It's not added to the Unity event at runtime. But in this specific case, that's fine because I'm setting up a prefab for a player controller. So it's going to have a damageable character and it's going to have a player controller. So just referencing them by dragging this down here and then triggering the function on the player controller I need to is going to work really well. But if in your game, another object that wants to reference this Unity event is going to be spawned after the scene starts and you don't know how many of them they're going to be or so on, uh, then you wouldn't be able to reference them in the inspector because the game object doesn't exist in your scene at the start of the scene. So it's only when it exists in the editor that you can add them in like this using drag and drop and then just calling the function you want. But once again, since it's a prefab component referencing another 
component on the same prefab, then it's guaranteed to be there. So this works really well. Okay, so lastly, I wanted to talk about where you use this unlock animation function. So this is being called back in each animation that needs to unlock the animations, which would be on hit, on death, and I think on attack as well. So when you have a function you want to call in the animator, you would just find the animation, and then you add an animation event up here at the top. So you can trigger it at whichever frame of animation you want. And then over here, you can see I am selecting a function. And this gets all of the functions that can be called uh, from the components on the game object. And then you just look through the list. You find the function you wanted to call, in this case, destroy character. So you add a new one. You just right click, add animation event. And then you find the function you want to call. So in this case, when a character is done dying, it's going to destroy the character, which is actually on the damageable character script right here. Destroy character, destroys the game object, removes it from the scene. Uh, but the other animations like hit are calling unlock animation, which is currently from the player controller. So that's how you add an animation event. If you need something to happen at the end of an animation, like returning control to the script so that it can play other animations like walk or idle.